Hi everybody, I'm Jack the Ramingly Wreck and Turn. Welcome back for our final video in Augustus Along, our month-long read-through in the lives of the 12 Caesars by Suetonius. I've had a huge amount of fun this month, uh, and it's been a busy month as school started back up, but I've had a huge amount of fun. And I just want to start by saying thank you to everybody who's been involved, uh, whether you're just reading the book, uh, whether you're reading it and really enjoying it, um, those who've been, you know, uh, uh, adding comments or questions. I've, I've really appreciated that. I've really enjoyed this. I've read this book a couple of times, including pa uh, portions of it in a class once, and it has been just as enjoyable reading it with everyone here as it has been at any other time in my life. And I'm even, you know, relearning or learning new things. So I've really enjoyed this. And maybe this becomes something I, I'll do every August. Uh, and I'll ask, at the end, I'll, I'll ask for some feedback on that um, for anyone who's interested. But let's jump into the Flavians. Uh, they're an interesting sort of... <laughs> microcosm of the Julio-Claudians and just three emperors. So we have Vespasian and then his two sons, Titus and Domitian. And their, their uh, period of rule kind of acts as a transitional period from the Julio-Claudians into uh, a, a third, they act as a second period. There's a third period with the five, five good emperors. And then after that, the Western Roman Empire basically goes to hell. Uh, so we start with Vespasian, who comes across as very homespun, down to earth. He seems he seems like the kind of you know the 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 emperor you could grab a beer with type uh, a joke almost plays here. He feels like the kind of character or individual who's like a a, a football coach <laughs> or or you know a beloved like coach type figure. Um, he's <laughs> but in terms of the historical narrative, he almost acts as a a. Uh, like the closer, he comes in and just ends all of the chaos that's been going on for a year. He he uh, he's sort of a winner, but he's he's a uh, he's a gracious winner. He's not looking to settle a bunch of scores. He's not looking to remember everybody who backed him and everybody who opposed him. He really does seem to bring a level of stability that the empire has been sorely lacking. Um, and I I almost liken him to the the holding midfielder who's brought in to just kill the end of the soccer or football game, depending on your. Uh, geography or a, a closer in baseball who comes in to just like cl get those final outs and end this let's move forward and that's who he is historically um there are there are little fun little notes you know Suetonius loves the gossip so we have the bit about how Vespasian is not from a super wealthy family not from a historically like noble family uh, or, or important family. And so someone makes a thing about, oh, we found, we traced your ancestry. And, you know, the, the, the sycophants are used to wanting to flatter emperors. So, yeah, there's a relationship to Hercules. And he just bursts out laughing. He can't contain himself. Um, he, he generally is smart enough to not try to be a major operator during the reign of Nero. Uh, he does, though, offend Nero, apparently, potentially by either leaving during a performance or <laughs> falling asleep. I don't know which would have been more fun like to actually see happen in real life. Um, and then Suetonius also gives us, and this is an interesting aspect of Suetonius that I haven't really noted, uh, but throughout his work you'll notice he, he is very conscientious about detailing the omens that portend something. And so we see that uh, with Vespasian and then later on with Domitian. Uh, and with Vespasian it's all around how he's going to rise to power. And, uh, and so Suetonius really details those, some of which... It's that whole hindsight is twenty twenty. People look back and say, "This one's happened." I wonder if it's signified. Uh, you get that sense, um, and that we're now up to a point where uh, Suetonius is sort of, you know, has some. There's some level of he lived through some of this. You know, he probably doesn't recall. He certainly doesn't recall Vespasian's, you know, a, a, a ascension to the throne, but he he probably has some level of understanding of who the Flavians were. Um, we also get. <laughs> <laughs> business. So Vespasian is going to restore some security, restore some dignity, uh, some stability to the Roman Empire and to the Roman army and to government. He he kind of goes through, there's some anti-corruption levels, there is uh, an effort to um, kind of like weed out, you know, the, the unnecessary components. Uh, but with that, we get the little bit where Someone come, you know, a, a new appointee comes in who just reeks of perfume, and the spatian immediately cancels the order and says, "I wouldn't have minded so much if it had been garlic," because you know we've got to be, we've got to be very sober as a Roman Empire now after that nonsense that Nero had, you know, the the, the depredations of Nero 
But then after that, whatever was going on with Galba, Otho, and Vitellius, Vespasian is going to end all of that and, and sort of, you know, reassert the, the Roman tradition. Uh, he does, however, of course, you know, Nero would have bankrupted any government and a, a year of civil war does no, you know, certainly does additional damage. So Vespasian levies a number of taxes, you know, fees. He has this bizarre, you know, avaricious aspect where he wants to cut himself into the bribes. Like he cuts out the middleman of the bribes and just collects it himself and gives whatever it is the, the, the middleman was going to procure. Uh, <laughs> with the memorable one about the, the uh, you know, tell me how much you were bribed to, to be here. I'll pay it and fix fix the wagon and the mule so we can go on. <laughs> um, and then there's the last little anecdote about how, despite generally seeming like a down-to-earth, uh, non-vindictive non individual, he always seemed to be really focused. And so he said, you know, well, you know, he asked, when are you going to say something funny about me? And the guy goes, well, I will as soon as, you know, you go relieve yourself. Because he <laughs> just looks so uncomfortable all the time. Uh, so we do have Vespasian, and again, uh, the one thing Suetonius doesn't um, push on too much, and he doesn't do with either Vespasian or Titus, that a lot of uh, modern readers, particularly in uh, Europe or uh, in the United States, might find with those two is they are in Judea, uh, you know, putting down the Jewish revolt when the year of civil war begins, and the army starts to say, hey, wait a second, what about Vespasian? Like, he's, he's with it. Why doesn't he become emperor? Um, and that Jew, the, the ways in which they put down the Jewish revolt are very bloody. They're very brutal. Suetonius doesn't really dwell on that much. Um, and that, that is probably something else that needs to be noted around Vespasian. Is the, the way any, Roman, any revolt against Rome was generally dealt with quite harshly. Uh, the destruction of Jerusalem, of course, is uh, uh, with the influence of Christianity across Europe and the United States. Um, the, the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple there under the armies that had been commanded by, by Vespasian and Titus is, is like a, a, sig a historically significant event that Suetonius doesn't really, you know, dwell on at all, even. Uh, and Josephus, the historian, Fla Flavius Josephus, the Flavius comes from the fact that he sort of became a turncoat with the Flavians um, and wrote uh, his, his books on the Jewish wars or the histories of, you know, of uh, the Jews um, under their auspices. So Vespasian is succeeded by Titus, who only reigns for just over two years. And Titus brings us to uh, something we've seen Suetonius do where he dwells on an emperor or a figure in, a, in an almost hagiographic way, in a way that suggests that he really thinks like, this is one of the, you know, we're going to, the, there's the five good emperors who are later on, that's really in the second century AD or CE. Um, Suetonius sort of identifies that there are people who could have been among the good emperors, some of, most of whom never became good emperors. So. Drusus the Elder, Tiberius's younger brother, a younger um, adopted son, stepson of Augustus, he got a mention. He was father of Claudius and younger brother of Tiberius. Um, Germanicus got five something pages uh, in the chapter on Caligula. He's Caligula's father, he's Claudius's older brother, he is likely poisoned. Um, but Titus seems to almost be this, this idea of what would have happened if someone like Drusus or Germanicus had ever become emperor? Someone who's capable, someone who's talented, someone who doesn't seem to be uh, vindictive and bloody-minded, but is also younger and talented and, and, and could theoretically rule for 20 or 25 years and provide stability and peace. And that's what, I, I get the sense as a reader that that's what Suetonius thinks Titus could have been. And that a number of historians feel that way about Titus. And I guess the only question I have is, is one thing all three that Drusus, Germanicus, and Titus have in common is none of them got to be emperor for five to ten years. And with some of the different emperors we've seen, after you've been or in the supreme autocratic power for a period of time, then your true character starts to be revealed. I happen to think that Drusus or Germanicus probably would not have been extraordinarily evil, corrupt individuals. 
Um, but we don't know. Part of the reason they might be so beloved is because they never had autocratic power to use and, and like abuse. And so Titus kind of, I, I always just personally wonder, does Titus fall into that grouping? Um, so I do want to read <laughs> paragraph three from, uh, from the, there's only like seven pages on Titus because it's such a short reign. But he goes on, uh, when Titus came of age, the beauty and talents that had distinguished him as a child grew even more remarkable. Though not tall, like this patient, he's a little short. Though not tall, he was both graceful and dignified, both muscular and handsome, except for a certain paunchiness. He had a phenomenal memory and displayed a natural aptitude alike for almost all the arts of war and peace. What a guy. Uh, handled arms and rode a horse with great skill. Who, you know, this is like everybody we've ever wanted in one guy, but hold on. Could compose speeches and verses in Greek or Latin with equal ease and actually extemporized them on occasion. He was something of a musician too. The fact that that's in there after Nero just always, always kills me. Sang pleasantly and had mastered the harp. It often amused him to compete with his secretaries in shorthand writing, or so I have heard, and he claimed that he could imitate any handwriting in existence and might have been the most celebrated forger of all time. What? I think that paragraph just goes to show um, Suetonius really feels Titus, you know, should have been emperor for a hundred years and everybody would have been better off for it. Uh, as I mentioned, we do have the Jewish revolt. Titus commands, you know, sort of the end of the Jewish revolt, which is very bloody, is very violent, um, is, is, a, uh, is a horrifying, um, you know, suppression of humans. Um, and we also get this from the Jewish revolt comes this little kernel of history that has become magnified in the arts. And that is that during the revolt, uh, the Herodians were, um, were not like from a traditionally Jewish family. They're actually from a, a neighboring, um, uh, kingdom and had been placed uh, sort of as client Roman client Kings over, uh, um, that region. And they then converted to Judaism and, and, and were sort of like culturally Jewish, even if they were not by, by their heritage Jewish, you know, um, from Herod the Great on. But Berenice is, is this Jewish queen, and she in some ways is perceived as the first century AD or first century CE's Cleopatra. And later on there will be um, uh, Queen Zenobia from Palmyra. And they are all, all of the Eastern Queens are viewed with tremendous, um, uh, and, and by Eastern, it's North Africa, you know, Palestine, um, Syria, those areas, uh, of the world, the Eastern Mediterranean, but they are perceived with extreme distrust by, uh, by the Roman patricians and the Roman populace, such to a degree that Titus potentially was going to marry Berenice. Uh, he seems to have been in love with her, and when he became emperor, realized, oh, that's not gonna, that's not gonna fly, and ends up sending her away, and that's sort of a major like signifier that Titus is gonna take being emperor seriously. Um, numerous uh, artists have have found that story interesting. Uh, Jean Racine wrote a famous tragedy on it that almost acts more as like a precursor to Ibsen. Uh, it's not a particularly, it's not certainly not a bloody tragedy at all, uh, but it, <clears throat> it's. Interesting. I'm, I'll be putting up a video on that uh, later this weekend, probably. Uh, the other things that Titus encounters, well, we have the eruption of Vesuvius, which wipes out an entire, uh, uh, you know, like multi-city system. Famously, uh, Pompeii and Herculaneum are, are wiped out, but a couple of other small towns around there. Pliny the Elder, as a Roman admiral, bravely goes in to try and rescue people. He, you know, he does his job and uh, dies there from the fumes um, and there's a an intense plague that breaks out but not only is all of that happening Titus also has to contend with the fact that his younger brother Domitian is constantly a thorn in his side is constantly maneuvering conspiring just the worst <laughs> and so Titus dies young and enter Domitian who bizarrely seems to have had some capabilities in it as an administrator. He's almost like Augustus and Tiberius rolled into one. He has some real capabilities as an administrator. He can work through 
administrative problems, organizational problems, bureaucracy. He can navigate all of that really well. He also just happens to be a generally unpleasant, you know, narcissistic, terrible person whose cruelty becomes more and more and more manifest as his reign extends. Um, to, to a degree that in the book of Revelation, uh, at the end of the New Testament, there's uh, a beast that comes out and it has multiple heads that sort of probably signify the Roman emperors. And Domitian is sort of this, almost this like Nero reborn uh, to that writer. So Domitian, it's important to note, is much, much younger than Titus. They don't grow, they're not, it's not um, uh, the relationship we saw earlier with Tiberius and Drusus under Augustus, where they, they compete with each other, but they're also both ca capable and, you know, talented, and they name their sons after each other, and they seem to care about each other. This is a very different situation where Domitian is always in Titus' shadow. He's very much the younger brother. He can't stand his brother. Uh, he, <laughs> he makes all these petty little comments about like, yeah, we deified Titus, but big deal, you know, did we really deify him? He's, he's just, he has a serious issue with the way his brother is perceived as this like golden, you know, Apollo, like just all conquering hero. And he is not perceived that way. He demands commands. He essentially just wants to start wars in order to make a name for himself and show that he's just as capable as his brother. Um... When Vespasian dies, he even considers, and again, maybe this doesn't happen, but with everything else we know about Domitian, it probably at least was considered, he considers trying to just out-bribe the army to declare him emperor and just skip over Titus, despite the fact that Titus seems to have some, you know, talents. Um, he, uh, within, his, within his administrative work, he takes Vespasian's anti-corruption measures and you know, Roman stability measures, and he extends them. And while Vespasian had some, you know, maybe he taxed too much, Domitian extends it to a degree where it's no longer just loss of status or taxing, it's actually violent. Like, there, there are violent repercussions for violating the various, you know, uh, rules Domitian wants to impose. And that starts to, you know, rankle the populace and certainly the Senate. Uh, and mind you, the entire time all of this is going on, Domitian is engaging in affair after affair. You know, do as I say, not as I do. Uh, the other component, of course, is that like Caligula, Domitian feels the need to be worshipped as a god. <laughs> and we have some details around that. Uh, <laughs> never a good sign. He's very sensitive about the fact that he's balding. Uh, he... Uh, <laughs> Uh, he endears himself to a certain degree to the troops so that they are quite upset when he's assassinated. But the Senate basically rejoices. Um, there, there, there does not appear to have been a huge amount of uh, grieving for Domitian's death, uh, the way that there certainly was for Titus uh, or for even to a certain degree probably Vespasian. Uh, the one thing that's interesting about Domitian is that we finally have an account, and again, this is sort of likely because this is much closer to when, when Suetonius is writing and to his own lifetime, uh, that when Domitian is assassinated, he actually fights his assassins. We don't really seem to have an account of that occurring. The other assassinations are, are generally poisonings or they occur just very quickly and there's no real struggle involved. Here we have this graphic scene of Domitian struggling and grappling with an assassin and trying to hold them off. Um, and it's, it's poignant. I mean, murder is never a good thing. Uh, though Domitian was very evil and should not be in a position of power to do anything like that. Um, so let's go into a quick epilogue. So after, this takes us up through Domitian. What happens after Domitian is assassinated? Well, the Senate, power is not restored to the Senate, in case you were wondering. Uh, <laughs> the, Rome does not become a democratic republic of any sort where the people have a say. Uh, they actually turn and make Nerva the next emperor. Nerva has been a, a longtime ally of the Flavians. He's, he's a longtime ally of, ally of Vespasians. So very much it's turning to the next guy. Uh, and so Nerva comes in. Nerva only reigns, again, like Titus, for just two years. Uh, and in that time is forced, due to a revolt, to proclaim Trajan uh, as his heir and, and the next emperor. Trajan is the nephew of Titus. 
uh, and it's by marriage, so he's, he's not, there's not like a blood relation, but he's the nephew to Titus. So we really almost have a pseudo extension of the Flavian dynasty. They're not like Flavians, but it's a, it's a pseudo extension where it's a, the, a right hand man to Vespasian and, and the Flavians becomes emperor. He declares the nephew to one of the Flavians, his heir. He's forced to declare that. And then Hadrian is related to Trajan as well. And so the, the Flavian dynasty in some regards almost extends, though it doesn't for Suetonius and it generally doesn't for historians. Uh, that goes into um, Nerva, but especially Trajan, Hadrian, and then later on Antoninus Pius and Marcus Aurelius are included in the five good emperors. There is a Lives of the Later Caesars. And I've kind of been thinking, this, might, this is the first part of what's called the Augustan history. It's a later history modeled on Suetonius. This might be fun to read next year. I don't know. Uh, in terms of later Roman, like imperial history, we have uh, Amianus Marcellinus who is writing, this is like third century, fourth century. This is fourth century AD. Um, so we have Julian the Apostate is sort of a, quite a bit of what has survived as Julian the Apostate. But this is also really interesting. Um, I don't know, this might be fun to read next year. I also though thought, uh, <clears throat> Livy might be fun or it might be fun to do, you know, uh, Tacitus would sort of be a rehash of the same history Suetonius gave us. Livy would take us way, way back. Um, it's written during the reign of Augustus, but it, it is the Roman history leading up to, it's all, it's the history of the Roman Republic. Uh, so either of those, I'd be open to read either of those next August. In terms of other texts that relate to what we talked about this week, you have Pliny the Elder wrote in the Natural History which is not necessarily like accurate or good science, but it's really interesting. It's, it's, there's a lot of interesting little anecdotes in here around natural history that's, that's fun. Um, and then a major writer who was living during the time of the Flavians and, and was, was recording history would be, uh, later on, would be Tacitus, whose histories incorporate a, a fair amount of the beginning of the Flavian dynasty. And he also writes the Agricola and the Germania during that time. And that gives us the immortal uh, line about the, uh, the native inhabitants of Britain who are the only people on earth to whose covetousness both riches and, po and poverty are equally tempting. To robbery, butchery, and rapine, they give the lying name of government. They create a desolation and call it peace. There's a little propaganda for you from Tacitus. Sometimes that's translated as uh, they make a desert and call it peace. <laughs> that's not my view of Britain. <laughs> um, and uh, as I had mentioned, the uh, Berenice by Jean Racine. But the other one I was, it was, came from a comment from someone else was, you know, doing a read-along of Herodotus, the histories at some point, and I was thinking, this November might be a fun time to do that. So if, if you're interested in any of these, just let me know. I could, I'm more than happy to wait a year and do Tacitus or Livy or, uh, or the Lives of Later Caesars, which kind of carries on from Suetonius. Uh, but I've, I'm kind of thinking I might read Herodotus's histories in November and kind of break it out with, uh, there's five Sundays, and so break it out that way. So let me know. But again, thank you to everybody, and I've had a huge amount of fun with this. I've, I've learned some things, I've re remembered some things, and uh, it's, it's really been fun. Thank you. I hope everybody has a safe weekend. Bye.